What's up, everyone? Welcome to Perpetually Paddock, a forum for the discussion on all things Patek Philippe. Today, we are going to be talking about calendar watches. So the calendar watch has a long, deep, and illustrious history at Patek Philippe. And I think we should focus on the modern era mm -hmm. because otherwise, this is going to be a three-hour multi-installment segment. So let's talk about their original innovation of 1996, the annual calendar. Historically, there were two types of calendars in the industry. There was the perpetual calendar, which was extremely sensitive to hand regulation and had to be built at low volumes by the most qualified watchmakers. And then there were simple calendars, which needed to be adjusted five times per year. Patek Philippe brought them together with the annual calendar, which, you guessed it, requires one adjustment each year. 5035, standard mm -hmm. annual, 5036, basically the 5035 with a moon face. Correct. They became the foundation of an entire family of complications from the brand. Correct. And one of the reasons why it was so novel was because it made for a much more accessible watch. A, it was easier to use. B, it was at a more accessible price point. And it was groundbreaking, really not only for Patek Philippe, but actually the industry as a whole. It was hugely influential, mm -hmm. as you will find annual calendars from all manner of brands, from Audemars Piguet to Vacheron mm -hmm. Constantin to Zenith and beyond. It was probably the single most influential technical innovation of the modern era, simply because it spawned not just an entire range of Patek watches, but an entire industry's worth of imitators. For sure. And you know, you see that over time since it's launched in 1996, Patek Philippe has coupled that watch, or that complication I should say, uh, with other complications. You had the 5033, which was a minute repeatal annual calendar. Uh, you had the 5960P in 2006, which was the annual calendar flyback, and so on and so forth. Uh, all the way up until Watches and Wonders this year, which you had for the first time an annual calendar with uh, GMT functionality. And it's super important to remember that because the annual calendar is achieved with wheels rather than the perpetuals combination of levers and wheels, it's also more suitable for sports watches. And in Correct. 2012, we got the Nautilus annual calendar, which mm -hmm. is sort of like a best of. You get Patek's original innovation mm -hmm. in calendars with their iconic case, and that's a hugely successful model. And you know, for me, I love the utility of the complication, right? It, it serves a purpose, uh, it's easy to read, and it's easy to set, and honestly, you can't break it. I think that that's one of the biggest fears as a whole of the perpetual calendar in general, is just that this idea that you can break the watch and not the case with the annual calendar. So going forward, going backward, you're really not gonna mess anything up. Now, I'm a little partial, but folks know that I'm fond of the 5235 and all of its forms. This was really a landmark watch for Patek. Yes, it's an annual calendar, but it's also an annual calendar in a regulator, mm -hmm. and it debuted an all-new family of movements, the 31260. I still think it's my favorite from the brand, but it's had far-reaching implications because, as you mentioned, we now have a travel time annual, and it uses that same base movement. Exactly, and when the watch launched in 2011, it actually had a very modern aesthetic. And this differentiated from a lot of the other timepieces that they were producing at the time, which were more traditional. So it had sharper lugs. It had that satin green dial, similar to the original 5270. Um, and just the overall layout for me is actually almost more relevant today than it was back then. And most Patek Philippe clients weren't really used to the, the regulator display. And it takes a little bit getting used to, but once you're used to it, it's actually very easy to read and it makes for a quick telling at the time. And I think that this coupled very nicely with the annual calendar, just given the overall utility of the watch. And it is important to recognize that with the 5235, you had a lot of firsts. You had the first series production implementation of the advanced research technologies. You had an all new family of micro rotor movements and it really helped spawn a new generation of micro rotor automatic movements from Patek Philippe that were bigger, better suited to mm -hmm. display case backs that were, yes, finished beautifully, but also featured more intriguing architecture, individual bridges, a better internal layouts, things that were designed not just to get the job done from an engineering standpoint, but to be aesthetically beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be perfectly frank, it's, it's not alone. Oftentimes, the annual calendar has been a bit of a vehicle uh, for Correct. the expansion of the brand. If we go back to 2004 and the 5135, an enormous tonneau aperture calendar mm -hmm. that really helped to advance the state of the art for the gondolo. Exactly, and, and big for the time, right, in terms of size. Um, you could see Paddock transitioning uh, upwards in terms of the size, and at the time, if you wanted a larger dress watch, this was the only option really available to you. 
But I think what's important to know is just as you've seen the brand use the movement over time, um, it's become much more approachable for what I think is a, a younger, more contemporary collector. Particularly see this year with the launch of the 5326, which is the annual calendar with travel time functionality, 41 millimeters, this textured charcoal dial, very much a nouveau vintage in terms of appearance, syringe hands. And for me, just a testament of the collector base of today, right? The collector today is looking for something not so traditional such as the 5146, which was the heir to the 5035. And I know we're throwing out reference numbers, but the 5146 was effectively a larger version of the 5035, um, but with moon phase and, and power reserve there at the 12 o'clock. Um, and that's been completely abolished now. And so we see that more traditional annual calendar sort of being phased out. I, I truly believe mm -hmm. that the 5396 is next uh, in favor of this coupling of a more casual use for the watch. You have the, the 5905, which is a, a larger annual calendar chronograph, now only in stainless steel on a bracelet with a green dial. So uh, taking this complication, coupling it with something else, and just making it much more approachable, and especially for a younger, more modern collector, I would say. And it is interesting to see how Patek Philippe often uses the annual calendar to advance the state of the art and push collections where they haven't been before. Mm -hmm. The 5035 being the foundational annual calendar. Then we had the 5135, bigger, bolder, aperture-style displays advancing the Gondolo series into a new realm of size and youthfulness. The 5235 regulator with mm -hmm. its new generation of movement. But there's also the advanced research series. Correct. And the first three of them all annual calendars, mm -hmm. all implementing new silicon technologies, starting with the escape wheel, mm -hmm. adding the hairspring, completing the escapement. And it's really telling that despite the importance of the perpetual in Patek's history, they chose the annual calendar to launch this series. Mm -hmm. No, and, and I think that's, that's because, again, I think that there's, and it's not so much price point at that point, right? Because the, the advanced research line has traditionally done well really at, at any price point to which it would have been delivered. You know, it was, the, the culmination of it was the 5550 Perpetual that featured all three of the advancements. But you had the 5250, the 5350, and the 5450, which as you mentioned, were uh, straightforward annual calendar movements, albeit with a more modern aesthetic for each of them. Yeah, the, the satin dial is a signature of all mm -hmm. of them, just like the magnifier on the display case back is. And for that matter, when the time came to add a calendar to the sports watches, it was the annual calendar Correct. on the Nautilus that got the nod rather than the perpetual in 2012. No, exactly. Uh, and I think the, the reason being is that, uh, again, it's a, more, I, it's a more robust movement in terms of uh, not what it can do, but really just the, probably the beating that it can take. Yeah, w without a doubt, because it's based entirely on wheels, Correct. you don't have to worry about a delicate interplay of levers and slots on wheels that could come apart under shock. Now, it's also important to recognize that in the modern era, there have been a lot of major advances in Patek Philippe perpetual calendars. Fundamentally, the architecture of their perpetuals hasn't changed a lot mm -hmm. since the 1985-39-40, but we have seen a lot of aesthetic innovations over the years and a willingness to expand the kind of watch that can be a perpetual, and I don't think anything's more emblematic than that than the 5236P inline calendar of 2021. No, I mean, honestly, for me, a fantastic launch for them, right? Because they they took inspiration from a pocket watch from the past, and you have this modern case, satin blue dial, just very much, I think, a winning combination, and also a completely new visual display for them that they hadn't done previously since, since that pocket watch. And really what it's doing is it's, coming out with a complication that they've done many times in the past, but in a completely new novel way. And again, I do think that it has a more contemporary appearance. Now, often with Patek Philippe, the annual calendar is sort of the vehicle for innovation. We talked about that. But the perpetual calendar is often the vehicle for prestige, mm -hmm. which is why the Advanced Research Calendar Series concluded with the 5550 perpetual calendar. That was mm -hmm. the culmination of all the parts of the Advanced Research Scheme. Also, when it came time to go with a perpetual calendar on a sports watch, it was the Nautilus, not and the And done Aquanaut. in a precious metal, not in steel. Correct, that got the nod. 
Uh, we've also seen over the years that the perpetual calendar often is more exclusive, more reserved, always lower production because every single perpetual that Patek makes does have to be hand tuned. And a lot of times the interplay of the grand lever and the program wheel is something that doesn't just go together like Legos, it's something that really does require a master's touch, which is why you'll see relatively lower volume for watches like the 5140, uh, 5139. It's why you'll see lower volumes for watches like the 5327, even though from the dial side, they look a lot like the annuals. They're much more complex underneath. No, and you mentioned the 3940. Yes. And the 3940 was discontinued in favor of the 5140, which was discontinued in favor of the current 5327, which uh, larger in size, but still that traditional perpetual in terms of appearance. And I think that we're starting to move away from that, right? I think that they're always gonna sort of have that in the collection. Um, you saw them discontinue the, the yellow gold variation. They only now have the white gold blue and the rose gold. But I do think that you have this new idea that the younger collector wants a more contemporary Patek Philippe dress watch, something that's a little bit more casual in terms of wear. And you had that with the 5236. And you had that with the 5320, which was that cream dial, white gold step case, syringe hands, vintage in terms of appearance, and that was discontinued in favor of the salmon dial variation that just launched. And you're, you're seeing this sort of casual dress watch that really bridges the gap between the more traditional Patek Philippe watch and the Aquanaut Nautilus. And I think that it allows a younger collector to, to sort of have a more complimentary collection and want to move between the different categories. Yeah, there are really two types of Patek Philippe perpetual calendar today. There are the strictly traditional, like the 5159 or the 5160, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, to the point of prestige, nothing is more prestigious than a hand engraved perpetual calendar Correct. at Patek Philippe. You've got that kind of watch. Uh, you've got the 5327, which is very similar to previous pointer style perpetual calendars. Then you've got the inline calendar. You've got the 5320, a very progressive looking watch, fully loomed syringe hands, mm -hmm. Arabic numerals, much more contemporary than the others and with an aperture style calendar display. A plus, frankly, larger size at 40 millimeters. Correct. Um, and so I think that the trend is gonna continue in this direction. Uh, I think you're gonna slowly see some of those more traditional watches phased out in favor of a broader collection of more novel ways to display the complication, no different than the 5236. And it's also telling that a lot of the most modern releases have been very colorful. The ivory dial 5320G of 2017, the most recent salmon dial redesign, the I mean, let's face it, the 5236P is not just a blue dial, it's a blue gradient dial. How more, Correct. how much more of the moment can you get other than maybe green? No, for sure. And I think in the past, you saw families end on a dial like that, right? Like you saw the, I'll use an example, um, the 5170 chronograph. Very much was traditional in appearance and aesthetic, really up until the end. And the last dial color was that sort of gradient blue black. Now we're seeing these dials come out right away. And I think that it, creates a more demand for the product, but really just more an appreciation again to move between product categories. That if you're a younger collector and maybe you were a little bit more focused on the Aquanaut Nautilus and the 5159 wasn't for you in terms of appearance, it's now a lot easier, I think, to make that jump. And it's interesting to me because even as they're becoming more youthful, they are still paying deference to their heritage. For sure. And the 5320 is a great example of that because the dial is drawn from the ultra low production. I think they made two 1591s. Mm -hmm. Then the case is drawn from the 2405, if you want to see where that tiered lug comes from. So your first impression might be, well, that's a watch for a younger man. But then you look at where the source material is and it's, it's rooted in the 40s and 50s. Correct. And I think that they're drawing a lot of inspiration, again, from the museum and from these pieces and reinterpreting them in new ways, right? You know, they, they, they could have easily made the 5236 a more traditionally looking watch, right? They could have done a yellow gold or a white gold and have it not be such an avant-garde dial. But I think that the way they did it um, almost, for me, is, could, could be like a standalone watch, right? And I'm sure that there'll be different iterations of the watch. They're not gonna use the movement in only one configuration but it was a standout launch for me in terms of coming out with the first one. 
And there's been a ton of willingness to elaborate and experiment with the calendars over the years. I think if we go back to the somewhat infamous 5150, the T-150 mm -hmm. Tiffany, uh, it was an annual calendar with a rather quirky month aperture and all of that in an officer's case with a hunter case back. Then you fast forward to uh, 2006 and you've got the 52 or 5296 with a sector style dial, 5396 I should say is our annual calendar, but the 5396 sector dial was extremely historically rooted uh, but also profoundly provocative and to this day other than maybe the 2012 Tiffany 100-piece limited edition, mm -hmm. that is considered the definitive 5396. And what I find fascinating is actually up until a couple of years ago, the sector dial 5296 and the sector dial 5396 weren't the most popular iterations. People actually preferred it without the track. And I think that you could see them making that transition, but the market at large maybe not being there just quite yet, right? The, the collector at that time still preferred a more clean dial. And I think now, if that watch launched now, it would have came out to probably a lot more fanfare. I mean, even myself, I'm wearing a 5970G right now, which uh, Lemania-based uh, perpetual calendar chronograph, definitely traditional in terms of appearance. But even this watch, when it was launched, um, they did it with uh, blackened indices and hands which was very non-traditional. Uh, it made it for an easier to read watch. The case was definitely a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker. And, but as far as my own personal preferences go, what they're launching today is very much up my alley, right? And for the first time, I would say I'm gravitating much more towards pieces that are coming out consistently new right now than pulling from the past. And I think the best Example of that, if we're not talking about the 5236P, it's the weekly calendar. Mm -hmm. it, it gets lost in discussions of calendar watches because it's neither an annual calendar nor a perpetual calendar. But in terms of shifting production from steel Nautilus to steel watches generally, new types of dial design, mm -hmm. avant-garde, willingness to use handwriting on a dial, weekly calendar indication. And frankly, it was also the vehicle for the launch of the 26330 Next Generation Automatic Movement. That's mm -hmm. a very important watch. For sure. And I mean, again, like a lot, it represented the first time since the 5522, which was a grand exhibition watch, uh, or the 5565, which was a steel sector dial watch that was launched when Geneva uh, re rebuilt the, the salon. New facility was open. Um, but uh, it was the first time, really, since um, the 60s or 70s uh, that they had done a steel Calatrava. And they did it in a 40 millimeter case. So a contemporary size a material that's not regularly used. As you mentioned, a handwritten dial, nouveau vintage in terms of appearance, which of course is very relevant today and pervasive across the whole industry, and the, the launch of the new movement. So for me, um, it checked a lot of boxes, but again, it gravitates more towards a more modern collector, and I keep using that term over and over again, but it's, it's, it's not the traditional aesthetic. And I think that it, it represents a bridge again, from that 5159 or that 5140 or 3940 to the more sporty pieces like an Aquanaut or a Nautilus. And when we talk about generations of collectors and youthful watches and uh, kind of a passing the torch, there is a distinct change from the guy who was collecting expensive watches in the 1980s who mostly just wanted pocket watches. Mm -hmm. Like if you were into mechanical watchmaking in the high end, especially on the vintage scene in the 80s, you wanted pocket watches. As that boomer generation came of age in the 1990s and the 2000s, we began to see a demand for more fine wristwatches and complicated wristwatches. Mm -hmm. A lot of the first generations of modern Patek perpetual perpetual calendar and annual calendar systems uh, from the retrograde calendar 5050 in the early 90s, the annual calendar in 1996, to the retrograde officer's watch 5059 in 1998. All that came out in this period. And now you're starting to see that there is a generation uh, comprised of, I would say, Gen X on the older end and the millennials on the younger end who are into these watches. And that is, that is the youthful group we're talking about. We're talking about 25 to 55 for the most part. Correct, and we, we've seen a transition where, I mean, in all honesty, there is a far larger amount of, let's call it sub 40 year olds that are buying into these pieces that are wanting to build out collections. And they are fascinated with the aesthetics of the Aquanaut and Nautilus. And again, not just because it's some hype watch, but because that these are icons of the industry um, that really harken back to, you know, the Nautilus harking back to the 70s. And so 
as they've gotten used to wearing sportier watches, it really was almost too big a divide for them to transition into a, a 5159, let's say, right? And it was just, they just were so different. And I think that the watches that they're coming out with really do bridge that gap, right? Like you take the new 5270 Platinum with the green dial. And again, uh, traditional complication, perpetual calendar chronograph, the, you know, the, um, the air of this watch, in-house movement, but doing it now with a, like a, a, a greenish black dial that's far more modern in terms of appearance uh, and more relevant today. And again, I think that it also speaks to something else that Patek Philippe is doing, which is having something thematic across product lines. In the past, you really would have a launch and it would be like a standalone launch. Um, now you have a green dial uh, on a 5270, but you also have a green dial on a 5905 steel and a bracelet, but you also have it on a Nautilus. So you have this element that is moving across different product categories, tying everything together, and will probably consistently change over time. And we're seeing chances to take risks mm -hmm. uh, fully exploited because we talked a lot about the 5236P. We didn't talk much. We talked briefly about the weekly calendar in steel, but we've got a lot of steel calendars now with the 494718 mm -hmm. from last year. Shantung rug style dial loomed from the factory right out of the gate, full steel, full mm -hmm. bracelet. This is an example of the future of Patek Philippe. If they're not going to be making quite as many 5711s in steel each year, they're going to roll out new Calatravas and calendar watches in stainless steel as everyday wear. And bracelets are a sign of that because with a bracelet, this is a one-for-one -one replacement for the sports watch on your wrist. You see the 5905 uh, in stainless steel with the green dial that they actually discontinued the platinum variations and it's now only being delivered uh, in stainless steel on a bracelet with a green dial. And I think it's to your point that you're gonna see um, perhaps stainless steel use a little bit more in Caltrov and complications and transition more of the sport into precious metal, if anything.